Good morning and welcome to our third Atlanta Forging Forward webinar series. I'm Deborah Ryan and I've spent over 20 years in the Atlanta nonprofit foundation um, and consulting communities. I'm currently the Atlanta Managing Director for Changing Our World, which is a firm of impact consultants that work, we work in nonprofits and fundraising in all areas. Changing Our World is a part of the Diversified Agency Services Group of Omnicom, which makes us the only ph philanthropy consulting firm that's part of a Fortune 200 company. Changing Our World not only works with nonprofits and in fundraising, we also have a corporate team of dedicated and experienced professionals who work with our corporate clients to look at their strategies to make sure that they better align and then figure out how to meet their goals and, the, and how to get there. Our corporate team specializes in everything from corporate social and citizenship strategy, planning and implementation, measurement, employee um, volunteerism and engagement, as well as cause related marketing. Forging Forward Atlanta in our third session today has built on, we're proudly building on our national forging forward that our firm launched right at the beginning of the pandemic. We wanted to be able to have a forum that we could learn from um, experts and professional peers in this really changing world. And currently it's in its 37th week. We hosted a national um, forging forward uh, that also focused on Atlanta and Ann Kramer was one of our panelists. And we realized after that, that there were a lot of issues in the Atlanta community that would, that we could focus on and really talk to leaders in the philanthropic and the social impact investing and in the nonprofit world to really think about solutions and how we could impact our community. And that's how this webinar was born. Um, we're excited about today's conversation. It's our first of 2021, and we're focused on how corporations, particularly Atlanta-based corporations, can really support the Atlanta community in these changing and challenging times. We have three incredible panelists um, that I'd like to introduce you to, so I'm gonna jump right in. And first, we have Ann Kramer. She is an Atlanta leader and the former director of IBM Corporate Citizenship and Corporate Affairs for the Americas. Anne has served on the committee of the Council on Foundation and chair of both policy and corporate communities, chair of the United, Ways, Ameri United Way of America's National Corporate Leaders Council, executive committee of both the Institute for Competitive Workforce and the U.S. Chamber's Business Leadership Center, who awarded Anne with its first Lifetime Achievement Award in Corporate Citizenship. Anne is also the past chair of the United Way of Metro Atlanta, Leadership Atlanta, Research Atlanta. She served as the president of the Junior League of Atlanta and was, was chosen by the YWCA for its first Outstanding Women of Achievement recognition in 1984. Anne also chaired the Volunteer Task Force for the Atlanta Committee on Olympic Games. In 2020, Anne received the Atlanta Business Chronicle's first lifetime, first corporate social responsibility lifetime achievement award and Georgia Trends Georgia Hall of Fame. And we just thank Anne for being a friend, not only to Changing Our World, but to the Forging Forward Atlanta web, web, webinar and appreciate you being here today. Thank you. Our second panelist, Ventina Terry, is the Senior Vice President for Metro Atlanta and Corporate Relations for Georgia Power, the largest subsidiary of the Southern Company. In this role, Ventina is responsible for the company's operations, sales, customer service, economic and community development, and external affairs activities for the 1.4 million customers across Metro Atlanta, as well as statewide statewide responsibility for Georgia Power's work in underserved communities, people of color, the elderly, women, and LGBTQ. Bentina currently chairs the Board of Directors of the Atlanta Beltline Partnership and serves on the Board of Directors of the International Women's Forum Georgia, the Atlanta Police Foundation, Leadership Atlanta, 
the Grove Park Foundation, and Atlanta Beltline, Inc. She's on the campaign committee for the Wardrobe of Arts Center and the advisory council for Truist Atlanta Open. In 2021, she was named one of Atlanta Magazine's 500 Most Influential Atlantans and has been named one of Atlanta Business League's 100 Most Influential Women for several consecutive years. Thank you, Bentina, for being with us today. Our third panelist, who you can't see up here, but he's pictured um, below on the slide, is Lane Shakespeare. He's the Senior Director of Corporate Citizenship at MailChimp, a marketing platform for small businesses based in Atlanta. Prior to joining MailChimp, Lane served as the Executive Director of the Wren House Muse Wren's Nest House Museum in Atlanta's West End neighborhood. Lane joined MailChimp in 2011 and oversaw the company's sponsorship program before starting their corporate citizenship initiative. His team invests more than $3 million in the Atlanta nonprofit community each year and manages MailChimp's public affairs and sustainability work. Lane serves with Ben Pina on the board of directors of the Atlanta Beltline Partnership. And Lane, we're, we're sad that we can't see you, but we're glad that you're here with us today. Thanks so much, Deborah. Good to see you all, each of y'all. Great. So thank you. I want to first by saying thank you all, um, Lane, Bentina, and Ann, for, for taking time today to talk with us. And I figured we'd just go ahead and start with a brief overview of, of the corporate citizenship work. Um, Ann, we want to start with you. Great. Oh, thank you, Deborah and Bentina and Lane. It's so much fun to be with you. It is a joy. Um, well, it's so odd that you asked this question because, as you know, I've retired from IBM. And so with my IBM work, which was global, focused a lot on the Americas, which is Canada, United States, and uh, all the Latin American countries, that it's been a gift for me after those uh, arc of 46 years of IBM to be back in Atlanta and working with so many companies about developing their own strategies for corporate social responsibility. And it's been fun for me, and especially working with an organization like Go Beyond Profit, which is encouraging all enterprises, businesses large and small, to be in relationship with their community and to realize that being in business is more than just a profit. And I think for me, it's had such an impact because the, rea the realization is that, especially coming from a technology company and even a large global company like IBM, the assumption is, well, if I were IBM, I could have a strong CSR strategy and I could implement it because I would be big and I would be uh, already known and respected. But the and for me and what I've been doing the last six or five or six years is working with companies, whether they are fast start high tech or even some long-standing companies that had never really fully refined their strategy beyond maybe contributions and a little bit of philanthropy to really talk about how they can be fully aligned as a company, a business, an enterprise in this, in this community to be um, relevant and to be able to leverage their assets, whether it's their time, their talent, their treasure, their technology, in ways that really do improve community. So that has been my joy recently is to help and be involved with companies to help them reassess where they are in their own corporate social responsibility strategic focus. I can't think of anyone better. Thank you, Ann. Ventina, if you give us an overview of Georgia Power. Sure, good morning. And uh, it is always a pleasure to serve on a panel with Ann Kramer, uh, so I'm glad to be here with Ann. And then Lane Shakespeare, who I think just has the coolest name. I mean, I just, yeah. I don't even think I've ever told him that. But, um, so uh, I, I'd love to talk about what we do at both Georgia Cap Power and Southern Company. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our parent as well as Georgia Power. So whenever we're ready to show the slides. So I'm going to focus on our efforts around COVID relief. Uh, and around social justice, but I'd comment that the efforts that Georgia Power and Southern Company have to empower our future uh, are really much broader than that, um, but I am going to focus in on that and that our corporate citizenship and the work we do, of course, spans the work we do in the environment. We were, uh, we've pioneered some great grants that we've given to for Longleaf Pond Restoration, which is a huge environmental effort here in the South, 
as well as impaired body works, uh, water works uh, and stuff, think, things like that. So I'm not gonna talk as much about that type of stuff. I'm gonna focus it in on today's issue. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about our COVID relief efforts. So next slide. So we've been able, first of all, to not just, often when people think of what you do, they think about money. And at Georgia Power, we know that our bandwidth allows us to also be leaders in the communities that we serve. And a number of the members of the Georgia Power family served on, and this doesn't list them all, these are the ones here in Metro, on the committees that were trying to figure out how the community should respond to COVID. And it was very important that we be engaged with those business leaders and community leaders to figure out how we could, in some instances, talk about reopening plans, in other instances, just try to figure out what a path forward looked like, uh, what recovery looked like, task force. So we've done a lot of work. It's particularly in Metro, but in all across Georgia in that effort, Georgia Power. Next slide. We've also, um, you see very formal efforts. We've also done some great informal things. So we converted one of our Georgia Power drive through as a place where people could come in and get some assistance. In particular, um, they could make lease arrangements and, and things like that. We've done a great deal of volunteering across, volunteering across the state to provide meals uh, to healthcare and other frontline workers. Uh, of course, we've given to schools. There've been so many children who where they typically ate their meal, of course, was at school. And now that they're not going to school, we've been in efforts to provide those children with food. And then we, we partnered with Good Earth, which is a great uh, corporation, a company that's out there trying to figure out how you, again, help people who need food. So we partnered with them, funded with them to deliver meals to pre-selected customers who participate in our Senior Citizens Low Income Discount Program and reside within the city of Atlanta. Next slide. For us at Georgia Power, of course, our business never stopped. I, people often <laughs> say, uh, are you working from home? Well, Bentina's working from home because she can do her job from home. But of course, our customer service representatives, the people who work at our plants, our linemen, they're out still every day still providing reliable service to our customers. But as a part of our business, and to me, this is one of the good uh, indicia of whether or not you're a good corporate citizen, you have to also not just think volunteerism. You have to look at your business and ask yourself, how can I help my customers in needs? So we suspended customer discounts. We have payment plans and options. We gave relief on our summer bills. That's typically when people's bills are higher and with everybody at home for our residential customers, their bills have been higher. And we ticked up in this time, our customer outreach through our energy assistance programs and corporate relations. So we've been trying hard to really assist those customers who are in need in our area of expertise as well. Next slide. And then there has been a financial response. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the amount of, of money we've been able to provide through our Georgia Power Foundation. So you can see the number of grants. The money has been spread across the state of Georgia. It's extraordinarily important to us at Georgia Power that we support the entire state, uh, not just, of course, Metro where we're headquartered or Atlanta where we're headquartered and that a lot of those dollars did reach underserved communities. And that really matters. There was a lot of talk about whether or not the people who needed the aid were getting the aid. And at Georgia Power, we tried to make sure it was the people who needed the assistance that were getting the assistance. Next slide. We also created a small business cap fund because uh, in all the conversations that we had, there were a lot of discussions about how small businesses were suffering significantly, so across the state, uh, half a million dollars, which gives technical support. We also partnered, and uh, we love to partner at Georgia Power with CDF, CDFIs in order to support, provide that support. We can't touch all those small businesses, we don't know them. And lots of these nonprofits or CDFIs already have programs in place, so it allows us to utilize pre-existing resources, not create them in order to provide that. And 60% of the businesses we touched were minority or women-owned businesses. So again, trying to reach those businesses that were likely in the most amount of need. Next slide. And of course, we contributed to other efforts that were um, bigger than just Georgia Power. So the Community Foundation, we made a large grant to them so they could disseminate funds through their process and Giving Kitchen and of course, Augusta University that was doing statewide COVID testing. Next slide. 
So in the midst of what we call the three pandemics, right, the economic pandemic, the healthcare pandemic, and then of course, uh, the issues around social justice and, and equity, we've been very engaged in that spirit as well. Uh, and Georgia Power, as well as Southern Company, has been engaged a very long time in that. We are a citizen wherever we serve, and that's all of our communities. That's why the corporate relations department that is a part of my organization exists and has existed at Georgia Power for quite a long time. So let's talk a little bit about what we've done around moving towards equity. Next slide. So we, we've given, uh, through our Georgia Power Foundation, a great deal of money, of course, to try to support many organizations, large and small, who we know work on social justice and racial inequity uh, things in our community. We look at two types of organizations. There are policy organizations, and then there are grassroots organizations. And we know that they have different impacts on our community, so we try to give to all of those. We also encourage our employees, and I sit on a number of boards, to participate in boards because we know, again, that we bring a level of expertise to those boards. And then we have robust volunteering efforts. And, and it totals about a million dollars a year that we do in supporting our employees who are volunteering across the state. Next slide. So in response to the, the more recent things this summer, we made a $200 million, and this is Southern Company commitment to racial equity and social justice. Um, we decided to target those efforts on education, criminal justice reform, and economic empowerment. Those are areas in particular, education and economic empowerment that is already in the Georgia Power and Southern Company wheelhouse. We're already very invested in those efforts and really felt like we could ramp that up. But the criminal justice area is an area that is new to us. It dovetails somewhat with economic empowerment because we want to focus on successful re-entry and back into society. And we want to focus on early criminalization. So how do we keep kids from entering the criminal justice system? Those are the two parts of the system we want to focus on. We want to focus on organizations that really will move the needle. The needle. So we want to maximize our impact and our influence. And we want to coordinate that with partners. This is a part of or encompasses our earlier announced initiative for $50 million for HBCUs in particular. So we'll continue that effort and that is a part of our $200 million commitment. Also a part of that commitment, next slide, slide please, is something we're really, really excited about. It's our partnership with Apple for, for Propel Center. And while it will be stationed at the HBCU AUC campus here in Atlanta, it is actually an effort for all HBCUs nationwide to be able to use Propel Center. And through the partnership with Apple, we know we'll have the technology to be able to serve those students across the nation. It's a, a phenomenal um, partnership with Apple. We're very, very excited about it. The virtual campus and curriculum will just add so much for those students who aren't able to experience it. And then of course, the richness of the physical campus here in Atlanta at our own AU Center. So we're very excited about that effort as well. Next slide. So what we believe at Georgia Power and at Southern Company is that we must be the change. And so uh, racism has no place in our company or in our communities. And we want to be a leader in asking other companies to stand with us against racism. And that ends my, my part, my presentation. Thanks, Deborah. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you, Bentina. And thank you for sharing those. And next up, we have Lane. If you'd like to share, I know you've got some slides for us as well. Sure. Thanks so much, Deborah and Bentina and Ann. What a great honor to be on a, a panel with y'all. I'm so inspired by the, the work that you do um, personally and both through your companies. Um, so, so if you want to pull up this first slide, this is um, a, a graphic we made for MailChimp and our new website called BigChangeStartSmall.com, which is the culmination of eight years of doing corporate citizenship work, primarily here in Atlanta. Um, our team has invested $12 million in small and medium-sized nonprofit organizations, with the vast majority of that going to Atlanta organizations. MailChimp uh, was started 20 years ago by Ben Chestnut, our CEO, and Dan Kurzius, our, our co-founder. Um, and about 11 years into their tenure, they realized they needed some form of corporate citizenship. And I was just standing there, and so I was lucky to uh, take the reins and help them define what community meant for, mail, for MailChimp. Mm -hmm. Um, previously, I'd worked, as Deborah mentioned, I'd worked at a, um, 
nonprofit house museum, a, a struggling organization with about a quarter million dollar budget. And I, I think this graphic says so much um, because a lot of times when I would engage companies, uh, they would show up with 100 volunteers with uh, cans of paint uh, to paint the house. And really, if you look at me, like looking outside this window right here, I'm, I'm saying my house is falling down. I don't need any paint. I need someone to put the, the wall back on the house. Um, and I, I, I've taken that with me uh, at MailChimp as we define what community is, and as we show up for the small and medium-sized organizations that are often characterized as, as high risk um, or a low ROI, um, or maybe you know the volunteer program of the company doesn't always match up with the needs of the organization. And so through a lot of trial and error and, and frankly being inspired by a lot of uh, companies that have been doing this for a lot longer than we have, uh, we built a program that we, uh, that we describe in Big Change Start Small, but dot com. But really uh, the idea is that we support small organizations that are changing their corner of the world. Um, if you go to the next slide, we had a strategy um, all year long of, of these past eight years and we were doing really well on that strategy and then COVID came and uh, you know made all of that obsolete. <laughs> Our company was also scaling. So you know, unlike Georgia Power, we haven't been around for that long. And uh, three years ago, we didn't have offices outside of Atlanta, and now we have offices in uh, Santa Monica, in uh, Oakland, in Vancouver, New York, and London. Um, and so our work needs to scale beyond Atlanta while still solving for impact. Uh, and I want to share this uh, campaign that we did in March of last year because uh, it reminded me of the Forging Forward series, uh, which you know, has been online, I think, since March of last year. Uh, South by Southwest was one of the first uh, big conferences and big events to get canceled. And, uh, you know, it was leaving a lot of people uh, really out on their own, but especially the short filmmakers. You know, there's a big film festival with um, independent filmmakers at South by Southwest, which gets a lot of attention, but there's also a really important um, meeting of uh, short filmmakers and their year was out the window. And not only that, uh, they had paid for all their travel costs and probably weren't gonna get reimbursed for them. And so what we were able to do uh, within two weeks uh, was license 70 of the short films that were uh, due to take place at South by Southwest. Uh, we put together a new website, um, a new marketing campaign uh, called Support the Shorts. And we let uh, those short filmmakers uh, screen all of their films for free. Um, yeah. And so it greatly expanded their audience, uh, but it really you know, let creatives know that they have a home at MailChimp uh, in a way that, ex that expanded beyond Atlanta. Uh, it really expanded beyond borders, uh, but was really focused on impact and focused on empowering the underdog. Um, and so you know, that was the first kind of foray into uh, COVID-19 uh, while we were desperately asking to double our budget uh, to respond to the crises that were that were coming. Uh, so again, that, go to the next slide. Um, you know, and, and COVID came and it came and it didn't go. And then the racial justice crisis came uh, and that really, uh, you know, just it had already been here all along and it came to a head at the end of May in 2020 and really in June. Um, we knew a lot of the organizations that we had supported mm -hmm. in the past dedicated to equity and racial justice we're going to be hurting. Um, and so, you know, organizations like the Partnership for Southern Equity, uh, the Village Market, and the Atlanta Wealth Building Institute uh, initiative were really important uh, for us to give matching, uh, give multi year uh, grants to, uh, particularly because they weren't getting the kind of attention that other more maybe retail or consumer oriented nonprofits might get. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the racial justice uh, crisis really inspired us to have our employees start giving for the first time. Um, and so we were able to contribute uh, through employee donations uh, $230,000 to in initiatives like Black Lives Matter, the Equal Justice Initiative, uh, the Loveland Foundation, the Museum of Contemporary African Diaspora Arts, um, Southerners on New Ground, and the Oakland African American Chamber of Commerce, uh, really to display that you know the racial justice crisis is not just about the black experience uh, with the judicial system. Um, it's about black business, it's about black art, it's about, a, it's, it's an entire encompassing of what it means to be a black person in the United States in this moment in time. Uh, and so we wanted our equity work, our racial justice work to reflect that totality rather than focusing just on the racial justice piece. Um, and then, you know, the, the uh, pandemic really, if you go to the next slide, the pandemic really affected 
um, voting lines in Georgia in June. Um, and, you know, <laughs> Georgia voters felt like underdogs going into uh, the general election uh, in November. Most of the polling places uh, were uh, staffed by people who were over 70, who were most at risk for, um, for procuring COVID. Um, and so we inspired uh, 56 of our employees to sign up as poll workers, uh, which represents about 5% uh, of our company signed up to become poll workers in, in, in Georgia. Uh, we also partnered uh, on voting initiatives um, with electionday.org to make sure small businesses are vote ready. Um, but we also created votingonmymind.com, uh, which was a tool to let people know easily and quickly where their closest open early voting location is. Uh, there are a lot of these tools available um, online and you can go to the Secretary of State's website and you can cross-reference all their information and find the right location and hope, hope that it might be open and that you did all the steps right. Or you can go to a site like votingonmymind.com, which makes all that really easy, uh, which is what MailChimp does in the first place. Uh, we take enterprise technology and democratize it for small business mm -hmm. so that it's really easy. So, you know, Georgia voters, instead of taking all this time to maybe find the right voting, early voting location, could all of a sudden find that information and have directions within about 15 seconds. Uh, and I'm proud to report that 71 uh, voters from 71 counties used votingonmymind.com and, and basically everything uh, that was contributed towards this election really counted given, to, given how tight uh, it was. But those are three uh, just examples of the kind of work that we do. Uh, MailChimp's purpose to, is to empower the underdog. And so, yes, we do uh, that every day in the community by donating more than $12 million over the past eight years. But then we also uh, respond uh, to crises as they arrive and try to make something uh, that only MailChimp can do in a way that balances our brand, our people, and our community. Thank you, Lane. That's amazing. Thank you. So, so I just want to take this opportunity to say thank you to each of you for giving us an opportunity to kind of look in and see behind what the strategy and where your focus is. Um, and so thank you for doing that. One quick thing, one kind of housekeeping thing is if you have questions, if you're listening and you have questions, you can use the chat function. And um, if we have time, we can include them. But even if we don't have time, we will send your questions to our panelists so that they can follow up. So, so thank you all. Let's start off with Ann. And um, I just want to ask you about what are some of the trends you're seeing um, in corporate social responsibility? And how have these, not only nationally, but here in Atlanta, and, and what are the results, how have they changed as a result of what we're currently going through with, with the triple pandemic and the, just the, all the issues we're facing? Well, it's so amazing. I want to congratulate you, Deborah, for picking Georgia Power and MailChimp because they are exhibit A and A plus A plus Absolutely. of not only trends, but I think the way companies not only should, but are responding to these what are unusual times. So congratulations. And I hope that everyone who's tuning in realizes what a gift you have in hearing the story of Georgia Power and MailChimp. And ironically, those are two very different companies. One mm -hmm. is a heritage company for which we quote, don't have a choice. We, we've got our lights on, thank you very much, Georgia Power. And MailChimp, although 20, is still a young company in terms of corporate social responsibility. And yet what you have heard exhibit that both must be, if you're gonna be successful, nimble, flexible, innovative, responsive, relational, and in fact, using what um, I love to say, and I'm going to give a quick sort of a definition of sort of corporate social responsibility, but then and the trends we're seeing for 20 and 21 as what has come out of COVID, i.e. and the racial and social justice issues and obviously the economic concerns. And so if you think about corporate social responsibility, so many people, and you've referenced it with Bentina and Lane, have talked about it in terms of tradition, of philanthropy, and both, of course, are philanthropists. And yet, when I look at corporate social responsibility, or what's now called ESG, environmental, societal, and governance, it really does reflect the whole of a business. Because you heard Bentina and Lane were giving to businesses. Those are for-profit entities. It's not, quote, just giving to nonprofits. It's building up 
a community. So when you think about corporate social responsibility or ESG, it really is a company that is existing to serve its clients, yes, and uh -huh. to build up its communities because the duh is, if you don't have healthy communities, you don't have healthy clients. So we can all say, is that greedy? I don't know. Is it smart? Yes. Uh -huh. So as a company, you really have to think about what your basic values are. Who are you, your foundational beliefs? And then begin to think about your governance, legal, ethical, moral. And I'll tell you just today, we heard on WAVE, my favorite NPR station, that companies like Coca-Cola mm -hmm. are thinking about their legal and ethical commitments as they've made investments in either PACs and or political um, candidates that may have done some things illegal and they're really checking it because transparency is number one. No one can hide. And so as you think about it, that governance component is a critical success factor for companies, but it's also a part of how they are corporately in terms of being responsible to the society. The second thing is we heard a lot about DEI is people, diversity, equity, inclusion. But it's really about how we treat anybody how we treat our employees, how we treat our vendors, how we treat our contractors, how we treat our community is the people indicator, which is critical today. Everybody now has a DEI specialist, but it's so much more because you heard from both Ventina and Lane about their commitment to the environment, whether it is in reducing the carbon neutrality or your carbon footprint or the creation care or leaving the world better. I always love to hear Georgia Power talk about all of its forestry. Who knew? Mm -hmm. The greening of a company. And I know that that's critical for MailChimp as well. So if you talk about governance, people, the environment, the most important I always say is that promise finger is how you treat your clients. We've heard so many organizations that have whether their supply chain and or their clients by quote, ripping them off. Mm -hmm. It'll quote, undo your company. So delivering on your promise is a very important part of your corporate social responsibility and supporting the businesses with whom you get to partner. And of course the pinky, always love the pinky. We say that's your philanthropy, the making a difference finger. And in that finger is really the grip. If you don't have your little mm -hmm. finger, you can't hold on to that which is valuable. So for me, as I look at the trends of how our company, our community, and I want to include now, because I know there are a lot of nonprofit people listening, that this is true for any enterprise, that as you look ahead, and I mentioned, I'm going to mention a few of these trends, it's that any enterprise has these same opportunities to manage the environmental the societal and the governance component of being a responsible enterprise citizen. Because the only difference is a tax code. You can be a for-profit, not-for-profit, or public enterprise, and the difference you still have to deliver on your promise. So as we think about that in terms of trends, I'm going to quickly think through them is first of all, is searching for the truth. Companies now realize you cannot hide. They're in a global environment. If you have a web page and you think you're a little sole soul person enterprise, you're global. And people are going to find you out, good, bad, and ugly. So the facts, truth telling are critical components. The second is, of course, the environmental thing, like carbon neutrality, leaving the world better than we think, supporting the sustainability goals of the community, the creation care is very important. Likewise, this is where I laugh. Yay, MailChimp Lane. We love the millennials that they have, in fact, made us stand with our employees and to understand not just loyalty, but delivering on their promise to their company. We have to treat each other with respect and really understand what that means. And I think when we've seen through COVID, it's an amazing response of how we want to care with and now we worry that our poor employees are there with their children and their families and having to work 24 hours a day. It's a very difficult thing, but companies know because 
uh, in a minute, I'm going to talk about some CEO concerns, and that is top talent, because they're losing folks and want to be able to keep them. And of course, for us, it's giving global is on the rise. They must be uh, responsive to the community, looking for the next big thing. We've gone from, as you know, in corporate social responsibility from being a good paternalistic contributor to now being an engaged, aligned, leveraging your resources across the enterprise. And what I've loved about looking at, at what Bentina showed was how you give is serving on community boards, mm -hmm. giving your expertise, with Lane is the pro bono. I love the um, when you think about the shorts that they got to use their access at MailChimp to tow their programs and how we can really think about a corporate community, not just plucking out $100 or having a fancy website that says that we are doing good work. It's a relevance across the enterprise about how a company is, how it works, how it relates to a community every single day. And I think that the thing that's been fun for me is to watch these kind of flips. The flip of indeed virtual volunteering is now a cool thing. Indeed supporting businesses as well as nonprofits is a cool thing. And especially supporting your employees is a really cool thing because retention is a lot more effective than having to recruit new folks. So as we look at the trends that um, we're seeing, it has been really amazing to me, and because you have two best examples, is how companies have provided resilient responses to the issues. And I'm gonna leave with that kind of response is that in many companies, we couldn't say things like race relations, racial in the structural racism, and now we're all having this conversation of recognizing where and how do we play our part. And so for me, I feel very proud for those companies that are not quite there. It's what lesson will they learn and how willing they will be to speak out. Because the last thing is that in a community like Atlanta, it's been the corporate community that has stepped up, spoken out, and been the leader courageously on many issues that others wouldn't speak up and speak out on. So I feel quite proud, frankly, of our corporate community because they have been courageous and bold in spite uh -huh. of, as each Lane and Bentina talked about our three major pandemics. And of course, I always add education as the fourth when you talk about um, what we've been living through. So it comes with pride and gratitude to our corporate leaders. I think that's very well put, and and thank you. I completely agree with you about having Georgia Power and Mailchimp, and really <laughs> and looking behind the curtains and seeing how two two committed businesses are doing so much in our community. So thank you, Anne. Um, Bentina, you know we're facing some of the most complex challenges in re in recent history, and you talked about. Um, the commitment to racial justice and and Southern Company and Georgia Power's really the commitment. How do you balance? You know, Georgia Power has been, I know from my nonprofit days, what a strong supporter Georgia Power was of the organizations I worked for. So how do you balance those those Atlanta nonprofits that get the money, that depend on you, that you're you've been mm -hmm. um, strong supporters? with these new issues. And I love the way that you talked about the policy and the grassroots organizations. So talk a little bit about the strategy or just the thinking behind that. Yeah, so it's something we're, we're still learning to balance, right? So we don't want to turn our back on the backs on the many nonprofits we've given to, but I just said, we're entering a new area. Right? We've never really given a lot to the criminal justice. We've given some, but to the criminal justice area and in taking that on as a new focus area for us, that will mean we'll have to change or shuffle right. what we've done with dollars. Because unfortunately, what we don't see is the pot of dollars growing exponentially, right? They're going to grow a little bit, we hope, but they're not going to grow exponentially. So we've got to learn to balance that. But one of the things that we've been starting to say to our nonprofit partners, no matter what they're doing, is 
you need to be thinking about racial equity in your work. Mm -hmm. So we recently met with a nonprofit. Their mission has nothing to do with racial equity. We don't want them to change their mission, but they're coming up with a new program that's going to help train people to work in a certain industry. Well, are you working to figure out how to train folks in a way that shows you understand systemic racism? Are you working with folks perhaps who have criminal records to figure out how you can get them re-employed? Are you looking at people in disadvantaged communities to figure out how you can get them employed? So we're also asking them questions that we haven't asked before, we probably should ask. What does your board composition look like? The dollars that you spend, are they, do they spend with equity in the community, right? So we looked at who you serve, do you serve a diverse population? When you're building a new building, what are your supplier diversity goals? Do you have minority recruitment as a part of your own strategy for your staff? Um, if you have a minority executive director, what does that mean for your institution or your nonprofit as opposed to one that does not? And so I think what, we're, what we are looking at is everything through an equity lens and nice. asking ourselves, you don't have to be a nonprofit that does equity work because there's lots of other work that nonprofits need to do, but you have to be a nonprofit that invests in equity as a part of one of your principles as well. So I love that idea. You're not asking them to change the mission, but just demonstrate it. That's great. Um, Lane, I'm going to go to you and, you know, you talked about the underdogs, but you also and um, investing in the smalls, but one of the things, um, why is it important and, and what kind of led you to MailChimp um, educating your employees? You talked about you know, the different things that y'all were able to do, um, but what, how is that a driver and why is that important to MailChimp and to the people who work for you? Well, I think Anne really uh, nailed it uh, when, when she talked about, you know, millennials driving change. <laughs> And I can say this as, a, as an older millennial, um, and the stories about them are true. Um, and and if, if I may be so bold, I would say the same with Gen Y. Uh, they are looking, at, as am I, uh, for purpose in, in our work. Uh, okay. And I think that's demonstrated not just anecdotally in what we see and what we hear. Uh, Mailstream's employees are like 75% younger than me. So, I, you know, it's just kind of the air that we breathe. But if you look at places like the Edelman Trust Barometer, Trust in business is higher than anywhere else. And really, when I think they're saying trust in business, it's trust in my employer. And so much is, is, is put on the employer, especially in a technical company like MailChimp, where you've got this competing uh, war for talent, frankly, uh, and the expectations are very high. Um, and so that's why, you know, whenever our team does anything that's meaningful or substantive in the community, we always have to balance three things. One is, are our, our, our people proud of this work? And they're already going to be committed to, you know, social justice uh, by default almost. So are they proud of the work that we're doing? So equity has got to be involved in what we do. Uh, is this effective for the community? Um, and then finally, is this uh, building our brand? Is this a brand expression? Is that three-legged stool that we're always looking to build? And so, you know, the, Back in 2017, we built a program called MailChimp Community College, which is a leadership program uh, for MailChimp employees uh, centered around the idea of equity. Uh, you know, when you work for a tech company, you hear this word equity thrown around. And it turns out it's, it, it means something totally different from the definition of equity that I learned uh, when I worked for a nonprofit, which is the roughly speaking, the intersection of justice and equality in the community. Um, and you know, so many of our employees were not familiar with that definition of the word equity. And that was sho a little shocking to me because, you know, being in Atlanta, one of the least equitable metro areas in the, in the United States, um, you know, we were talking about equity, but, but it was a totally different conversation. And so we partnered with about, with the Community Foundation for Greater Atlanta, and uh, we built this 32 hour program where employees could get the shared understanding of what equity is uh, okay. and through different lenses, whether you're talking about transportation, criminal justice, affordable housing, uh, the arts, homelessness, you name it, um, and then gave those employees a $200,000 stipend uh, to grant out to organizations doing the best, most effective work in equity. Uh, so this work has been kind of fundamental uh, to what MailChimp's been doing all along. Uh, and so we were prepared when the racial justice crisis came along to, to better support our, our partners that we've been working with for a long time. But I'm proud to say that our employees were 
educated and ready for this moment in a way they wouldn't have been before uh, we built Mailship Community College. That's an amazing program. I'm, I'm envious of when it comes to Mailchimp, so I can do that and putting your dollar, putting your dollars where your priorities are. Um, before we go to the next question, we've gotten a question from the audience that I'm going to kind of open up, and Anne, you can start us off, but I'll open up for everyone. How do we get businesses actively involved in in addressing community issues, especially equality, equity, workforce, and education? So, what's that? How do we get it? How do we I'm encourage be, I'm going to be an unabashed cheerleader. There's some <laughs> of the organizations in our community that are doing just this. And one is our Metro Chamber, for instance. Let's just take that one. And having taken a huge lead and leap, frankly, relative to having their CEOs all involved in things such as when we did the hate crimes bill last year or other issues like the religious right on um, especially concerns about um, uh, LGBTQ population. So to me, as well as now, the chamber is working with all the companies to help define what talent requirements you have. How do we better interface with preparers, the local colleges, the urban leagues, the, all of the different organizations. But to me, if I am a company, I need to be at the table. And one way is to be at the table. The and is not only at the large table, i.e. like a chamber, and that's true, you saw from Bentina's map where she has folks on the boards of all the chambers, and I would say I support all of them as a business. Because the and is then you find out where there are other organizations, i.e. nonprofits or businesses, like I am on the Russell Center for um, Innovation and Entrepreneurship, which is growing black businesses that you can then be a part of that community. So you have to be at the table first, that's first step. Begin to listen and learn where you can share your assets called the resources of your company in ways that can be a part of the, um, the race issues, the DEI issues. And I love how Bentino decides equity. How does that lens look across all the, all the aspects of your company that all five fingers to be able to <laughs> demonstrate it but to first is you have to get to the table to listen and learn where and i back to sort of you lane is listen with your employees is they will tell you not only what they think but how you can be a, a better engaged citizen as a company that's great and Tina, how do you think we can get more businesses actively um, involved in, in addressing these issues? So I'd, I'd say kind of, I think Anne was, was alluding to this too. It's great that, that Lane and I are here to get to talk about MailChimp and Georgia Power, but the Atlanta community is, is full of companies that are doing many great things that we hear absolutely nothing about. Right. And so, and it's oftentimes in their particular wheelhouse or however they can do it. So I, I do want to shake a little bit of a myth or underlying assumption in that question that there aren't a lot of corporations doing some great things. It's just that corporations talk about them in varying degrees. Large corporations do tend to talk about it more because they have PR departments that, mm -hmm. you know, that help them talk about it. Uh, and if you're a public corporation, and not only do you do it because it's the right thing, but you've also got the ESG uh, shareholder <laughs> movement. And so, but there are lots of corporations doing lots of great things. I would say if you're in a company and you don't see what you'd like to see in that company, so let's let's say it that way. One of the things that you can do is try, like Anne say, attach them to the chamber where there are lots of opportunities for them to interact and learn more about other companies who are doing great things. But the other thing, find little things that other companies are doing and be able to suggest those little things. Because for some companies, it's just about taking that first step. They may have some idea that it's going to pull their employees away from doing their business and be concerned about that. But if they can have a role model, someone else that they can see doing it, who is like them, then oftentimes it gives them kind of the sea legs to be able to yeah. try it themselves. But there, and there are lots of role models and examples out there. I think that's a great point, Tina. Thank you. And Lane, just your opinion on on getting um, businesses more actively involved. You know, I, I think these are all great points that Ann and Bentina made. And the only thing I would add is, you know, if if you're having a hard time 
persuading your company to get involved, uh, maybe tie it to recruiting. Um, more than half of our employees, our, our new recruit, new employees mention our corporate citizenship work as a reason they join MailChimp. And then once they get there, one of the highest performing engagement scores we receive is, are you proud to work for MailChimp? Nice. And, and most of those folks reference unaided our corporate citizenship work and our work in the community. The reason I'm proud to work at MailChimp is because, and so not only is it the right thing to do, and not only is it a beneficial thing to do, but it's going to help you get folks in the door, the right folks in the door, and then help you keep them as well. And so I point to it as a competitive advantage uh, for firms like ours when we're looking at ones that don't have it, um, or maybe even Bentina, the ones that are doing so, but doing so quietly. Because I don't think that, um, I think that, <laughs> that folks could be a little louder about this in this particular moment, uh, about the good work that they're doing, whether that is for the benefit of the community or for the benefit of themselves. Uh, but I think now's the time to speak up. Mm -hmm. Great. Great point. Thank you. Um, so now we've got we've got a very interested um, audience today. And Bettina, I'll start this question with you. What advice would you give to a, a newer startup, um, smaller nonprofit? How can they make themselves attractive to a corporate funder like Georgia Power? So you you do have to build that bit of a reputation. And I know that's like little chicken and the egg. Right. Uh, but of doing the work. I, I think that that's the, the most important thing. Have a mission that is clearly articulated uh, and make sure that you, you are very comfortable with partnerships, as especially as a new nonprofit. I think that part of what we worry about a little bit, and I know Ann has seen this through her career a lot, <laughs> is this everybody starts a nonprofit because something's important to them, but there are 20 other nonprofits <laughs> that do the exact same thing. And I can't give to all 21 of you. And so it really is about figuring out a lane where there's work that needs to be done, clearly articulating that, and then showing that you can do that work. Perfect. Thank you for that. Um, so how do you, with your corporate foundation, Bentina, and, and how you give, how do you get other corporate foundations, or do you... How do you communicate with corporate foundations and do you work together and do you pick up the phone and go, hey, Coke, are you going to invest in this? I mean, just give us a sense of how if corporate foundations work together and, um, you know, the kind of impact you could have or if there are reasons you don't. Just curious. Well, we we um, we talk. I mean, we make independent decisions. Right. Um, right. And, and all of us have boards that typically make those decisions. So your, your corporate foundation exec mostly is making a recommendation to their board about whether or not that's something that should be funded. But we do talk to each other to try to understand different perspectives. Do they hear the same thing? Do they understand the same thing? Sometimes they've got a, a record with a particular organization that you don't have. So you want to know what their experience has been like with that particular nonprofit or the lens through which they're seeing those efforts. So we do talk and we do encourage you and we understand you'll talk to a nonprofit and they'll say, I know if you give X, Y, Z will be more <laughs> likely to give. Right. Uh, and so there are times where um, you want to be the first mover. You say, uh -huh. we're gonna do this and we, and then you may help them help that nonprofit that's something you feel very strongly about get in front of other foundations to bring more money. And so it's, we work well together. It's a very, uh, it's an awesome community. Uh, the Mike Anderson actually is the senior vice president for the Georgia Power and Southern Company Foundations. And uh, I get to talk a lot and work a lot with Mike uh, and the other foundations that we have in Atlanta. That's awesome. And we, when I was a nonprofit, we would call them those good housekeeping seals. If you could get that grant, you could, you know, leverage that hopefully to get other grants and, you know, individual funders. Mm -hmm. um, so, Blaine, when you look at how do you identify, Bentina talked a little bit about the newer startups, the smaller nonprofits. So, you know, what is it that what are your recommendations for those types of organizations on, on how to potentially get funding with, with a company like MailChimp? Well, once again, I agree with Ann and Bentina completely. I also, you know, when we started this work, we re realized that there was no, there wasn't a high appetite for risk in this industry, mm -hmm. generally speaking. <laughs> um, and so there weren't, there wasn't, um, 
a funder to be there first for the very small organizations that are just getting started. Maybe you don't have your 501c3 yet. Maybe you don't have, um, a, you know, all your all the all your T's crossed just yet or your I's dotted. Uh, but maybe you've got a combination of, um, I don't know, let's call it excellence, momentum, and marketing ability. Uh, maybe Mailchimp is is a company that you would want to approach for that. We're never going to be an organization's biggest funder. At least that's we we don't want to be that. But we would love to be the first one. Um, and I say that saying no, we, saying that we say no to most of the requests <laughs> we receive. And I and I, I agree with Anne, you know, and Bentina, find your lane that is unique. Um, yeah. So, for instance, if you are trying to start a new theater, maybe I would try to dissuade you from doing that <laughs> at this moment in time. But if you have a no, uh, an exciting new uh, social enterprise that really addresses the needs of your community in a way that you have not seen it being addressed before um, and you have an ability to tell that story maybe you would approach a marketing company like mailchimp who respects uh that storytelling ability so that we can provide deborah that good housekeeping seal of approval for the next funder that comes along and says well if mailchimp has vetted these folks maybe they're maybe i can consider them as well Perfect. I like that. Be your first, but not your biggest. Well, um, so I think we could spend all afternoon talking. This has flown by, and we genuinely appreciate the questions from the audience. But I want to go ahead and um, and ask the last question. Even though we didn't get into, I'm, I'm glad that um, Bentina and Lane both could talk about COVID a little bit and their COVID funding. But I, I like to end the, um, and I stole this completely from Ann Kramer, but um, I'd like to ask each of you, what are the things, now that we're entering our second year with COVID-19 pandemic, what are the things you'd like to take forward with you from, from the pandemic, and what are the things you'd like to leave behind? And Bentina, we'll start with you. So, of course, I'd like to leave behind not seeing and hugging and loving all <laughs> Lots of people in my life. I mean, I, there's nothing like an Ann Kramer hug, right? So um, <laughs> I have, uh, I, I will miss it. So I, I do think that social interaction, it's nice to be able to see people over the video and to see people that are far away from you. But it will be so nice when we get back to having some level of social interaction. But what I'd like to take with me into this after post COVID is the creativity that we've seen people demonstrate. Um, living in an environment that that just so drastically changed how they did business. And I remember um, on the nonprofit boards, I sit many of them going, I don't know how we'll raise any money this year because we can't have our gala, we can't have our golf tournament, we can't have our big, huge events. And almost all of them to a team raised more money this year than they raised last year. Or, you know what I mean, pre-COVID. And so I'd like for us to really just think about what I think it makes you do is really level set and think about what's important and think about how to be creative and getting to what we really need. And I hope we continue to think that way. I'm not saying that we should never have any galas ever again, but I think we need to <laughs> reconsider the models we've been using to raise funds and ask ourselves, are they the most efficient and effective ways to reach people and to raise money? I think that's great. Um, Lane, what would you like to take with you and what would you like to leave behind? Uh, well, Bentina, that was a great answer and, I, and I'll uh, approach it from a different way. But first, I, I do want to leave behind just maybe one fewer crisis. Like this was just <laughs> too many. And I, it, it's too, we've been in crisis mode for 10 months now and, and I'm getting a little tired of it. So just one fewer would be great. Um, I think, you know, Leaning on creativity is what I want to take with me. Mm -hmm. Bentina addresses from the nonprofit standpoint, but I think from our corporate standpoint, you know, we threw our strategy out the window in March. And the first thing we did was we asked, you know, how can we make sure our, our current funders have, our, our current partners have flexible funding so they can weather this, these storms as best they can. But then after that, we were very nimble in being creative and in being resp in responding to crises, which is something that I tried to stay as far away from uh, before as possible. Uh, I, in in the past, you know, I look at these large companies who send, you know, hundreds of people uh, in the wake of crisis response, mm -hmm. and you know, I knew that we we couldn't do that. We, we're a smaller company; we've got 1,200 people. Um, they're all very busy behind their computers, and we're just, that's just not a core competency of ours. 
but a, a core value of ours is creativity. And we were able to come up with some very creative responses uh, to crises that only MailChimp uh, could, could do. Um, and so I, I want to lean more into that uh, as we go forward and hopefully uh, ad addressing one fewer crisis at a time, but still making sure that we're showing up when our communities need, need us the most. I love that. And of course, Anne's. What, what would you like to take forward and what would you like to leave behind? Well, it's so fun to think about that because there are some obvious ones like I'd like to take Zoom forward. I've enjoyed not getting in my car and I sure don't miss parking lots and parking decks. Oh, I hate those. So, <laughs> so I mean, they're all those kind of things that um, and I love how Bentina and Lane both talked about creativity. And in fact, the conference board and the business roundtable and the chief executives for corporate purpose have all said we've learned so much about office space and we've learned so much about business travel so that we don't always and I say that lovingly Delta, but I mean it's an interesting <laughs> thing about how we really can do things differently so yay zoom in bad or webinar or whatever we're doing, but I do think what I've learned a lot, and I hope. Um, we get to some quote normalcy of routine that is a bit predictable. But the one thing that I don't want is I really hope that we really can redefine profitability because mm -hmm. it's now so much dependent on people. We've always said profitability depends, but looking at the round table is not having stockholders be the prime, but people, stakeholders be the prime. So how we redefine the whole idea in the corporate world or business world of profitability beyond revenue. Yeah, we still have to read our P&L statement, but the and is about respect. It's about being responsible in the community, especially on issues that are often uncomfortable. It's to be um, in relationships with our employees and our communities and our clients and our suppliers and our supply chain, and to really understand the return the return our investment related to um, how we be, what are our values and our foundational beliefs. So I think that kind of flip thinking of redefining what it means to be a profitable company will help mm -hmm. us all. And thinking about those young people that we all know that lost their opportunity for graduation and having all of the jobs standing at the door ready for them when they graduated from college. Um, is to think differently and to be living into the differently. It'll never be back. It's how do we be forward. So that's what I want to go forward. Forging forward. Forging <laughs> forward. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just cannot thank Bettina and Lane. We appreciate you being with us. Um, and just thank you for this conversation. And I'm not exaggerating that I think we could keep on going, but I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So thank you. Thank you to everyone who listened. And um, stay tuned for Forging Forward Atlanta. Our next session is going to be on February 23rd, and we'll hopefully have another group of panelists that are just as fascinating and um, uh, insightful as this group has been. So thank you all for spending your time with us today. Have a great afternoon.